and at clinical examination, she had a vaginal septum. MRI indication was research of associated uterine anomalies. The first question we should ask ourselves is what is the protocol? We heard this earlier this morning from Dr. Mbinisha, but I would like to stress two points. First, in this clinical setting, it is absolutely necessary to have a large field of uterine to images covering the kidneys. And secondly, you have to start with a sagittal T2 views of the pelvis to place the coronal views parallel to the cavity axis and the perpendicular views perpendicular to the cavity axis. T1 axial views with fat saturation are useful uh, to rule out blood signal and in this case we use a general filling with echographic fluid in order to enhance the septum. So let's have a look at the images together. First, the large field of view T2. As you can, you can, you can see the vaginal septum and both kidneys in this case. And then the perpendicular views to the axis with the vaginal septum extending to the cervix, the double cervix or the septum of the cervix, the isthmic cavity and the two cavities visible in the corporeal region. So, under the T2 views parallel to the axis, we have a view of the septum in the uterus. And in this case, T1 images show no anomaly. So, let's look at it together again. The vaginal septum extending to the cervix. Then at the ischemic region, the septum is not visible anymore, and there is only one cavity. But in the corporal region, there are two separate cavities, and the septum signal is much similar, much similar to the signal of the myometrium. Under T2 weighted images parallel to the cavity, the septum in the cervix is visible, as well as the ischemic communication and the septum in the corporal region. And the most important point is that the frontal, frontal contour is convex. So, what is the uterine anomaly? Let's have a look at the American Society for Reproductive Medicine classification. I think we can quickly rule out the hypoplastic uterus or agenesis of the uterus and as well the unicornary tutors as we have seen there were two cavities uh, in this patient there, were, there was no history of in utero des exposure and uh, so we can rule it out too and the accurate tutors well we've seen there was a septum so what is the end? so we have now to rule uh, to make a choice between diadelphus tutors bicornerate or septates what is the analysis plan? It's pretty simple. There are four criteria to analyze. First, the morphology of the fundal control, the morphology of the cavity, the morphology of the cervical region, and the presence or not of a kidney animal. So is it a didal foot, a didal foot uterus? In a didal foot uterus, there, there are two separate symmetric bodies, and there are no communication between the uterine cavities. There are two services and there are 30% associated kidney anomalies. So we can rule it out quite simply. Is it a bicornate uterus? Bicornate is defined uh, by a fondal cleft over one centimeter in length, by a muscular system that can be either incomplete, incomplete with communicating cavities or complete with separate cavities, by one or two services in the more complete forms, and by the 30% associated kidney anomalies. So, in this case, there was no fundal cleft, we can rule out the bicornary tutors. Is it septate? Well, there was no fundal cleft. The septum may extend down to the cervix and vagina, as it is in this case, or it may be incomplete, and there is only one cervix, and the risk of kidney anomaly is similar to the risk in the general population. So in this case, the diagnosis was that of a septate uterus with septum of the cervix and vagina, ischemic communication with it, which is explained by the fact that the septum starts to resorbate in the ischemic regions, 
and the absence of kidney and <coughs> Now, why does it matter to make this difference? First, it's a frequent situation you're about to encounter with a prevalence estimated somewhere between 3 and 4 percent. Second, the step A to terrorists has an uh, adverse impact on fertility and uh, on the obstetrical um, outcome of the patient with pregnancy losses, as in this case, but also late aversion, <laughs> premature birth. And third, it can be easily rejected uh, via hysteroscopic intervention, and this intervention is indicated in case of repeated pregnancy losses, premature births, or unexplained infertility <coughs> by uh, any other uh, pathology, as we have heard earlier. Uh, the bicone rate uterus also has an adverse impact on the uh, obstetrical outcome, but it's much lower than septate uterus, and surgery in, in, is generally not required. The dilophus uterus has the highest possibility for successful, successful pregnancy of all uh, uterine congenital anomalies that are no surgery possible, and uh, the, the adverse impact is similar to that of unicorn uterus. So, is there anything else the surgeon needs to know at this point? Uh, it is said that you should measure, measure the width of the septum at the basis, the length of the septum, and the security margin of the fundal wall for the hysteroscopic resection. You should also try to assess whether the septum is fibrous or muscular, as it uh, may change the surgical procedure. So, what are the key points when assessing the uterine congenital anomalies? First, MRI is the best imaging tool, and it should absolutely, uh, your protocol should have a large T2, uh, T2 is a large field of view covering the kidneys, and coronal sequences parallel to the axis of the cavity. The key point is to differentiate between bicondrate and septate uterus, and for this you may rely on only one sign, the presence of a fundal cleft uh, less than over one centimeter is uh, indicative of bicondrate. You should look for associated cervical, vaginal, and kidney anomalies. And if it's a septate, first uh, you must precise, try to precise at least whether the septum is fibrous or muscular. And you should keep in mind that the septum can be resected. And with this, I thank you for your attention.